We have come to a landmark issue of Nintendo Power with Nintendo Power number 50 for July of 1993. We have several big titles to cover this issue, so let's get started. Our cover game this issue is Link's Awakening with a drawing of the Master Sword and an owl. In the letters column, there's a question over why the two other face buttons on the NES are X and Y. It apparently has to do with terminology and CAD and some engineering stuff. We also get some Legend of Zelda dad jokes. We start off our Super Nintendo titles with a wrestling game, and the first WWF video game to not have Hulk Hogan in it. WWF Royal Rumble. As the title implies, the game features the Royal Rumble, and I believe this is the first game to have the Rumble itself in it, albeit in a greatly reduced form. WWF Royal Rumble is a very button mashy game. While Doing punches and kicks requires a degree of timing. Doing grapple moves requires you to outmatch your opponent in order to pull off your intended move. Here's the good news. The AI opponent's proficiency at mashing is fairly weak compared to your own mashing. The bad news is, you're still mashing. A bunch. That said, the game is fairly basic. I do appreciate that the game includes regular match matches and options for a brawl match which basically allows you to use the chair at ringside without having to cause a rep bump first. Speaking of which, I also appreciate that this game has ref bumps, along with chiptune versions of the wrestler's entrance music when you choose your character, and most of the character's own moves. However, what the game does not have is a submission mechanic, and in spite of several characters, particularly Ted DiBiase, Bret Hart, and Ric Flair, all having their submission finishers. Also, weirdly enough, the game doesn't use Shawn Michaels' normal finisher. You'd think the sweet chin music would be a pretty easy thing to do a sprite animation of, but apparently not. Anywho, it's fine, and it's a good snapshot of a particular era in the WWF, just before the big exodus to WCW, but after the rock and wrestling era. Next up is Run Saber, an action game from Atlas. It looks like it takes some cues from Strider. We have maps of several of the early levels of the game. Run Saber doesn't so much take some cues from Strider, as much as it aspires to be Strider. The general run and slash gameplay is pretty much the same, except depending on which of the two Sabers you're playing as, you have an option for a vertical slash or a horizontal slash. The character I'm using here, Sewa, uses a vertical slash. The controls are generally better than Strider, and the animations feel much less stilted than the animations for Strider and if you press the D-pad in the direction of your vertical movement, then you can do your, an attack through your jump, which is a nice touch. The controls are a little interesting. The game uses the shoulder buttons to handle sliding to the left or right when crouch, but otherwise only uses three of the face buttons. Also, the game's soundtrack sort of uses what sounds like a sample version of FM Synthesis, in the sense that they built a sample library out of FM Synthesis sounds to use for the Super Nintendo which would fit with that hypothesis. These specific decisions led me to check to see if this game received a Genesis version, but to my surprise it hadn't. This game is a Super Nintendo excuse exclusive. However, there are some issues here. The game has limited continues, which as I've mentioned before is one of my recurring issues with home console games. Further, the game has some issues with enemy respawn. There isn't really a rhyme or reason to it. They pretty much come from almost any direction and endlessly. With Ninja Gaiden by comparison, if you move off, move the spawn point for an enemy off screen and then move it back on screen, that enemy will spawn again, and it will only spawn that one time. Here, they just keep coming from whenever and wherever. The placement in Strider by comparison felt more deliberate. 
All in all, Run Saber feels like an arcade game that is not shying away from the quarter muncher style, but this becomes a kind of a minus point because this is a home game, and thus there are no quarters for it to munch. Also, oddly, this game never received a Japanese release. This seems like it would be a perfect fit there, so there's that issue as well. Next is Evo, The Search for Eden, which is probably one of the more different RPGs that have covered thus far. We have info on each of the game's epochs. I didn't record very far into the game for this review, but I got a good understanding of how the game works, and I've also seen this game covered in several other places before, including a very good episode of the Watch Out for Fireballs podcast. In EVO, you play various organisms throughout the history of the Earth, having to survive by eating other organisms for health and to gain XP, which in turn allows you to evolve by developing new biological features. Technically, it's not proper evolution because you're not playing your offspring or your offspring's offspring, which develop those features, but the game drops some hand-wavy stuff to explain this. At the end of each epoch, you have a boss fight, and ultimately have to figure out the best evolutionary developments that will help you with that boss fight. It's a really unique concept for an RPG, and I'm kind of bummed we didn't get more games with, with this concept. I had some fun with this, and... I think this game would certainly worth you at least taking a shot at, at it, possibly through emulation before deciding if you want to buy it or not. Next up is an article with a rundown of a whole slew of edutainment titles, including Mario is Missing, the uh, Super Nintendo version of Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego, along with some blurbs on games that we previously covered, including the Miracle Piano Teaching System, AeroBiz, SimCity, and Sim Earth. Considering this issue came out in July of 93, I'm assuming this is a meant to be a, if you're a parent reading this, here are games for you to get your kid to get them ready for school kind of situation. Or what have you. Of these, we've covered basically all of them, except for Mario is Missing, so I'll be taking a look at that. Now, some edutainment games take steps to make things interesting to make the experience of playing the game engaging. Oregon Trail has the fact that the game involves a lot of resource management for putting together your journey across America, plus some action elements like like fording rivers, not just fording rivers, but action elements in terms of the hunting segments, and when you finally reach the um, border with Oregon, or in territory, deciding whether to raft down the Columbia also involves something in an action section there. Mario is Missing is not one of those games. The premise of the game is that Mario has disappeared, having fallen into a trap door at one of Bowser's castles, and has wandered through a door that took him to one of five Earth cities, and you have to go through these doors until you find them. Upon arrival at these cities, you have to stomp on Koopas until you find the ones that have stolen various landmarks, all at Carmen San Diego. However, unlike Carmen San Diego, the landmarks are still located in the same city, and you don't get any clues to actually find them, so it's just a matter of wandering around, stomping Koopas until you find the three landmarks, or using an FAQ to find out which Koopas have them. Once you get them, you get asked a few uh, trivia questions, like three per landmark about that landmark, and then you move on. That's it. In short, this is an edutainment game that really doesn't teach you much of anything. Skip it. Next up is Bubsy, probably the most infamous of the um, mascot platformers that sought to emulate Sonic's Tood. We have maps of stages 1, 4, 7, 10, 13, and 16. I'm not sensing any rhyme or reason there. This game is really bad for a lot of reasons. Let's start with one of the most basic elemental issues. If you stop moving on a slope and remove your fingers from the D-pad so you are providing no controller input, you automatically start moving down that slope. So already, Bubsy controls a little like one of those Soviet block cars that did a challenge for on Top Gear. The one where one of the challenges was to park a car on a slope, engage the parking brake, 
and then walk away to see if the car stayed where it was left, Bubsy would fail that challenge. On top of that, the game has one-hit kills with little feedback to where all your enemies are. Some of the enemies are clearly enemies, but others are far less clear. Is the gumball machine that's spitting out gunballs at you an enemy you can attack, or a hazard you have to avoid? The game doesn't tell you until you try to jump on it or it shoots a gumball at you and kills you. Mainly if you try to jump on it and nothing happens. Additionally, the game can kill you if you fall too far, but it's not consistent in how far too far is. Sometimes falling jump from a super high platform is too far, other times it isn't. Sometimes running super fast and jumping will kill you, other times it won't. This last, combined with the one-hit kills, is doubly frustrating, because one of the things that these types of platformers, and then Bubsy in particular, is trying to do is to ride on the coattails of the success of Sonic the Hedgehog. Part of this is put forward the attitude of the main character, as made evident in both his sprite and the digitized voice samples that are used for the character. However, part of this is also in the fact that Bubsy can move incredibly fast, and it speaks to how well they've implemented this game on the Super Nintendo, where they can really get a speed, sense of speed equal to that of Sonic the Hedgehog on here. However, in Sonic, what makes that speed work is that if you take damage when you are running that fast, if you have rings, you do not die instantly. Instead, you drop your rings and can thus recover, both in terms of having an opportunity to avoid that obstacle or enemy, and in terms of picking up some of the rings that you have dropped. Bubsy does not have that opportunity. All in all, Bubsy's reputation for being a bad game is absolutely earned, and this game is definitely worth a miss. Do not play this game. In Nestor's Adventures, Nestor is playing Tasmania, and the tip is that Taz will eat almost anything but prefers kiwis, which I'm pretty sure was covered in the guide last issue, so I don't know. We next get an article looking back at the origins of Nintendo Power, along with the timeline of the past 50 issues of the magazine. The article lays the credit for the creation of Nintendo Power magazine at the feet of Nintendo of America president Minoru Arakawa, who hasn't been mentioned much. They tend to focus more on Anglo names and American names and basically try to brush the fact that this is a Japanese company slightly under the rug. And Howard Phillips is all is also mentioned, and he has obviously been a much more prominent figure in the magazine. In the classified information column, we get an invulnerability code for Mech Warrior and a 75 lives code for Death Valley Rally, which should be more than enough to beat the game. Now, I could have sworn that the Star Fox comic was over last issue, but no, we're getting an epilogue involving the space pirate remnants of Andross's troops and some cosmic stingrays. We come now to Link's Awakening. I have gotten requests to cover the DX version of this game, and I think that when we come to that in the magazine, I will cover it, but for now, I will cover the game as released, the same way that I did with Final Fantasy. While Final Fantasy has still gotten much superior releases later on, for the review of that game, I stuck with the NES version instead of the Game Boy Advance version, for example. And I'm going to do the same here. That out of the way, this is the first really involved guide that Link's Awakening has gotten. We get an overworld map with the first three areas shown in detail, along with additional information on the overall sides of the map with the highlighted highlights marked. The map is also divided into three chunks based on where you'll need to go in order to reach the first three dungeons, and maps of the first three dungeons coming with it. Link's Awakening is a good, portable version of Legend of Zelda. The sprites are the right size with screen to go to once again manage that balance of giving plenty of character while also having the things be scaled the right size for you to be able to maneuver and get through environments. The game also does a really good job of managing the number of enemies on screen and shifting the focus of the game some from combat with the side of puzzles to puzzles with the side of combat. The music is also really good and the game world has a lot of character to it. A little more, I'd say, than the world in Link to the Past, which makes sense considering the twist to the game's story. Now, again, this game has received a re-release for the Game Boy Color later, and I'll get to it as it comes up and talk about the differences there. This, however, is the baseline, and the baseline is fantastic. It is 
a game that's really kind of hard to get into in brief, which is how I end up getting into a lot of these games for the show in terms of descriptions of them, but this is something that is absolutely worth your time. Gargoyles Quest 2 has gotten a Game Boy port. We have a complete overworld map and an order in which you are supposed to go to the various destinations. So, this is another of the instances we've come across in the past, where Nintendo Power has featured, even prominently, a game that never got a US release. In this case, Gargoyles Quest 2 for the Game Boy only came out in Japan. Considering how extensive this guide is, it's likely that the game had a mostly complete translation before it was cancelled, which means there are probably prototypes out there. If you happen to find one, please contact the Video Game History Foundation. Link is in the show notes. Now, for purposes of this review, I am playing a patched version of the Japanese game. Gargoyles Quest II on the Game Boy is a very solid port. The sprites are very well proportioned to the rest of the game's environment, and the game doesn't have quite the same problem with Leaps of Faith, Leaps of Faith that the first game had on the Game Boy. It's not to say the issues aren't there, but they aren't as much of a problem either through minimizing them or by mitigating the amount of damage you take from them. It is rather disappointing that this game didn't get a US release, particularly considering that the Game Boy has several more years of life left on it, and the NES not so much. Because this game is certainly a strong title. I do kind of like the NES version a little more, but this game has its strengths. Next up is a Game Boy version of Terminator 2, the arcade game. As in the light gun game. On a system with no light gun, or no way to use a light gun. Yeah. This game is not good at all. It's missing a lot of the character the arcade version had, due to the lack of graphical fidelity, and the game's music is very minimal, to being almost absent. Targeting enemies is alright, and shooting down missiles isn't as much of an issue. However, the very first boss of the game is implemented poorly, with the boss firing all three cannons at once, and thus in turn rapidly draining your health. Whereas, from what I recall the arcade version, the fire from the cannons was much more manageable, so the boss was beatable. Now, it was still cheap because this was an arcade game and they want your money, but it was manageable because they want you to get the later stages. They want to encourage you to keep feeding quarters into the arcade machine so you keep going to those playing and try to get to those later stages. However, the Game Boy version just eats your health and once you run out of lives, doesn't give you a way to pick up right where you left off. There are no mid-mission continue points. So... Unless you want, for some reason, to play this while you're out and about, I would recommend getting MAME and playing the MAME version of Terminator 2 Arcade, or the arcade version of Terminator 2 Arcade on your computer, with your mouse configured to take the place of the light gun. It would make for a much more enjoyable experience. In Counselor's Corner, we have some advice for Shadowrun. After the Super Nintendo version, we now have a NES version of Pugsley's Scavenger Hunt. The article has maps of the various areas in the game. The Super Nintendo version of Pugsley Scavenger Hunt did an admirable job of presenting the style of the Adams Family animated series in video game form. It still had the problems that were intrinsic to a game that was basically designed as an Amiga platformer then ported to the NES, but the visual style was there. This version of the game does not even have that. It plays poorly and without the strong connection to character design and the charm and the sense of nostalgia that comes with it that the SNES game had, removing any real reason for why you would want to play this game. It is utterly terrible, it is graphically unpleasant, and it is not worth your time. Speaking of demakes, we have a good one with Mighty Final Fight, a super deformed version of Final Fight. However, Unlike the Super Nintendo version, this game has all three characters from the arcade version, along with the level-up mechanic, though there is no two-player option. Mighty Final Fight is, frankly, one of the best brawlers on the NES, up there with River City Ransom. The sprites are incredibly expressive, and the developers clearly have, at by this point, learned the limitations of the NES hardware and have clearly taken account for it. We get a better managed number of enemies on screen at any one time, so there is no real issue with the sprite flicker, 
while also having the number of enemies on screen be enough that you can manage if you're playing by yourself, but also still having some challenge. The game also takes the level up system from the original Double Dragon and does something useful with it. And unlike Double Dragon, the game has a designated jump button. This is clearly a game that has looked at every other brawler on the NES, has studied them thoroughly, and taken some very valuable lessons from them. This is absolutely worth your time if you can find a copy that you can afford, because this game is unfortunately rare. Next is the NES version of Bubble Bobble Part 2. With the Game Boy version, I mentioned how this game felt like it would fare better on a television for a system like the NES, where we'd have a full screen that we could see at once. Well, we now have that version. Bubble Bobble Part 2 is kind of a pain in the butt. The game doesn't have the field of view problems that the Game Boy version has, and it's more colorful and bright than its predecessor. However, Bubble Bobble Part 2 manages to introduce a new problem. Control issues. Arcing jumps are just too clunky to be reliable. By arcing jumps, I mean jumps where you are moving in a particular direction when you try to jump. Particularly with some of the level designs in the game. This is an issue because the fundamental mechanic of this is trapping enemies in your bubbles and then popping those bubbles with a jump. And in some cases, you have to jump to hit enemies with those bubbles. So, if you are not able to do those things, you can't progress in the game. And thus, if the controls for those mechanics, for those actions, does not work, the game is itself harmed. So, that makes this game, unfortunately, very disappointing, because I, I kind of enjoyed the original Bubble Bobble. In the top 20, Star Fox now has the top spot for Super Nintendo titles. In the Now Playing column, among the many also-rans, is Ultima 5, The False Prophet, Dungeon Master for the Super Nintendo, and Star Trek The Next Generation for the Game Boy. Finally, in Pack Watch, we have a bunch of notable Super Nintendo titles, including Street Fighter II Turbo, Mortal Kombat, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Tournament Fighters, and Mega Man X. Link's Awakening is my clear favorite for pick of the week, though Mighty Final Fight is absolutely one of the best brawlers on the NES, and absolutely worth your time. Either playing it through, well, emulation, ideally legal em emulation, but emulation, or, well, through fi picking up a copy, if you can find one at a reasonable pr price, and obviously assuming you have a means to play it, such as the Retron 1, uh, the new Retron HD 1, which has been getting some favorable reviews, or other means of playing NES games. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.